as pastor of this crew, I am in- enormously proud of the work they did in Haiti. Um, you guys who contributed financially and with your prayers and with your eagerness of watching the pictures on Facebook and email and everywhere else, <clears throat> know how hard they worked from what, what you've seen. But I just say this, uh, it was amazing to me uh, from the oldest, uh, who Rick, I think, has me by a couple of months, uh, uh, to uh, um, Julia, at the youngest of the team. It was top to bottom a first-class uh, uh, work of, uh, of the Lord through these guys. Um, so you should be proud of them. So, okay, with that said, number one. I'm not exactly sure what we're supposed to be sharing, but what I saw... Uh, there was, it was a beautiful, beautiful country that had places of complete and utter devastation. But in the midst of all that, I saw a people that, though they had every reason not to hope, they were full of hope. Amen. That they looked at us not for a desire for us to pity them, but they wanted love. They wanted a friendship. They wanted fellowship. They didn't want a handout. They wanted someone to help them. Uh, and it was just such a blessing. They, even though we look at them and think how poor they are, they have so much love and uh, just caring for one another. They know how to build relationships and Though materialistically, they may have been without stuff that we consider necessities. They were very rich because they had one another, and they had the love for one another, and they had a joy for life. And so it it was just an awesome and incredible thing that I saw. And I just saw what amazed me the most was to see the body of Christ come together there were uh, 18 of us, and then I think there were 13 people from Virginia, complete strangers, and we worked together, laughed together, fellowship together all week with not not one disagreement, not one ounce of anything but joy and the love of Christ, and it was such a blessing. Amen. I'm that probably going to the same person. No, this is, this is the other one. <laughs> Got that a lot this week. Um, I'm probably going to come at this as a little, a little different perspective than most of these guys. I um, and the scripture this morning was just perfect. First of all, the rubble. We all know what the word rubble means. Um, we all know what the word bucket means. We passed buckets over, approximately not over, but approximately. 100 tons of rubble passed through these hands and the hands of the other team. In loading it, I'm sorry, I knew I was going to grab a tissue on the way up here. In loading it in order to throw it on a truck, thanks, <laughs> to, to throw it on a truck, to take it off the truck, to put it in more buckets, to take it to the house, at which time we unloaded it again and put it in more buckets again and put it poured it in a wall. We had assembly lines going both ways with full buckets and empty buckets. But that said about the scripture, the part that stuck out to me was the enemy and how those who were standing guard were the ones that kept the work going. And you guys here that were praying for us were our guards. You may not have had weapons in your hands, but your prayers went up to the Lord. You protected us. You encouraged us. You healed us. We had five drop during the week at some point on Thursday. Two of our teenagers, well, three of them, one stayed back from the work site because he wasn't feeling well, and two of the girls just dropped. I mean, just dropped in the work site, and they had to be taken back. But your prayers were what upheld us. The enemy was trying so hard to destroy the work that God was doing. And throughout that land, we saw that, and we heard a little testimony of that from someone who's living there now. He's a Canadian that's living down there. John had spoke of him when he came back last year, and he talked about the reality of voodoo there and how 
the people on Sunday will go to church as Christians, but on Monday they're back to practicing voodoo and how real it really is, and how Satan is alive and well. We so much take for granted our blessings here in the United States, and we sometimes miss out on the reality of the enemy, but he is very real, and God, praise God, is so much more real that he has overcome that. And through your prayers and your financial support and your help before and through this week, God has used, once again, the unity of the body of Christ to make a difference in a land that has been devastated physically by an earthquake, but not necessarily spiritually. Okay, well, first of all, it was a very humbling experience. I This is my first mission trip, so I kind of knew I didn't what to expect, but I didn't actually know what it was going to be like until I got there. And just to see everything, and it made me realize how much we do take for granted and that the people, the people are some of the happiest people you'll ever meet in your life. And um, one thing that really touched me this week was the kids because I spend a lot of time with the kids um, uh, the day after I dropped. Um, <laughs> um, they didn't really let me work too much, and Christian, one of the girls either, so um, we ended up sitting aside and just playing with the uh, little girls, and um, I'm surprised my head wasn't bleeding, but um, they braided my hair. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was really good, but... Um, <laughs> And another thing that day, it was our main job site, I believe. We worked on a bunch of different ones, but this was the one where we actually put the walls up and the rubble and the walls and stuff. But um, And just to see the mother of a few of the children there watching us, and she was just so happy to see her her kids just um, playing with us and being um, overwhelmed with that. But um, (laughs) we came up with a few things, Uh, Julia and Matt and Christian and Elliot, we were like the teens in the group, and um, we came up with the bucket shuffle. It's a new dance move. Um, The rubble shuffle, yeah. And, you know, I'm not going to demonstrate Julia can if she wants, but... um, (laughs) (laughs) But, um, yeah, and just certain things. I I guess we learned a little bit of Creole and French here, but... Um, we came up with some songs and we were singing with the kids and I think at one point I had like seven kids on my arms and back and everywhere but um it was just a blessing to me to see that they were so happy to see us there and that um we could show that we were there because of God and we were there to help them and um we got them and um, Creole, um, Jay-Z Renmen U is Jesus Loves You. And um, Jeremy, one of the leaders there, was saying how, um, just say that to the kids, say that to everyone, because that's what they're going to remember. And um, we were saying that to the kids one of the last days, and we had them pointing to everyone, and they would go, Jay-Z Renmen U, Jay-Z Renmen U, just to everyone in the entire group. And I'm pretty sure they covered everyone there, too. <laughs> But, um, so yeah, the whole trip was a blessing, and I'm very grateful I could get to go, and thank you for all your support and prayers. General, I do this under protest. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, um, I think when we went to aid, at least I, for one, got got more than I gave. Um, Sunday, we went to church, and the pastor, just like St. Paul, could bore you to tears, if not kill you. <laughs> but the singing was, it was in Creole. I didn't understand a word of it. But it was it was beautiful music, and to me it seemed alive. And now whether that was the spirit of God, I don't know. But uh, I remember thinking, Father, listen to, or hear your children singing to you. And the next thing you know, I'm uh, under extreme protest. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I um, I'll probably remember that far longer than anyone remembers me in Haiti. And then the children. 
uh, we took down some balloons, and they, went, they didn't ask for anything as you went by, but they were very happy to receive it. And the, the smiles, uh, the, uh, they seemed like they had more love. To my, if you go to the streets in Pittsburgh and walk down the street in Pittsburgh and look for people to look you in the eye, very seldom do they do it. And very seldom do I do it when I'm talking, talking to people. But in there they would. And if you nod to them, they'd instantly go into a smile and nod back, and bonjour, bonsoir, whatever. But just a very, I got more than I gave. Amen. And I thank John for that, for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to agree with John. I've been on a lot of teams, but not one that I've ever been prouder to be a part of. Um, we were... We worked like maniacs. I'm sure that the Haitians thought that we were crazy. Um, we would walk some mornings, 25, 30 minutes to a job site, work like crazy Americans all morning, walk back for lunch, and then walk back after lunch to the same job site to work like crazy Americans again. Um, and we always gathered a crowd. We always had people looking at us, um, just watching us tossing buckets. And we all have bruises, I think, um, um, small wounds, bigger wounds, whatever. But it was a truly amazing experience. And it is wonderful to share eight days with people that you admire and respect the way that I have come to respect the people that we were with and the people from Virginia. If you would see this land, truly, I'm sure you've all looked at the pictures. I hope you have. But it is, you know, there's a lot of slums and there's a lot of ugliness. But it is so colorful. They paint their houses. They decorate. Um, they use color everywhere they can. You can tell that they are very proud and they want to um, to bring light and color to their house. They welcomed us in everywhere we went church they were waiting for us they had the first you know we sat up front they had the first three pews benches whatever waiting for us um everyone there wears ladies wear hats on their heads and so they had a stack of doilies what are they called yes ready for us we don't have the knack of keeping them on they kept falling off as <laughs> as we were singing but um it was an awesome experience one of the high points of our evening every night after devotions was to read the greetings that you sent us in the comments that you posted on Facebook. Thank you very much for reading and, and responding to the pictures and the messages that Carrie put up. Mary several times brought us to tears, um, as did other messages that were posted. It was just such a touching thing to to kind of touch in or, or to to touch base with you guys every night. Um, it was it was wonderful. Thank you very much for that. I and mean, we didn't all know everybody who responded, but we all felt the love that you sent us, and we appreciate that. Thank you. I don't know if you guys have figured out this numbering thing, but um, we numbered off often to make sure we were all together. So I'm number six. Um, <laughs> And I just have a little illustration to share with you that I can't take credit for. It was another fellow on our team who's from California that brought this up, but uh, it really spoke to me. And it has to do with buckets, because uh, we use them so much, as you've heard. Um, almost every day we would get out there and shovel the rubble into the bucket, pass it on down the line. You probably saw the videos and things. Um, and in that process, there were a couple of the buckets that were broken and cracked, um, and probably if we'd been in the U.S., we might have tossed them out, but here we really needed them, and so they kept making their way down the line, um, over and over again, and, um, you know, we are broken vessels, like the, uh, reference from Second Corinthians, talking about how we're jars of clay, 
um, and how God uses us even though we're broken and imperfect. And that's great to know because personally I don't feel perfect. I don't feel like I have uh, the skill set of a pastor, for example. But God wants to use each of us, and we really are helpful um, in doing his work. So just something to encourage you. <laughs> She's number eight. I'm number ten. But this is how we went through Haiti. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't speak in public, so we wrote a little something. <laughs> this was my first mission trip, one of hopefully many to come. I really enjoyed my time, and this was my mama, Joanne, <laughs> down there. Okay. So working on the team, passing buckets of rubble, rubble in the 90-degree sun makes you very aware that no matter if you're the biggest and strongest, no one could possibly do this work alone. You need every link in the chain. I think that Jesus touched Pastor John's heart on his last trip to Haiti. Pastor John then asked his congregation to raise money for a rubble house. I have to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> With love, the congregation raised enough money for the four rubble homes and a team, to, team of 16 to build them. The team joined a bigger team of ha Haitian Christian. Christians, Christians from the United States and around the world, village people, and lots of children. And by showing we care, others will join the chain and have their hearts touched by Jesus, too. Thank you, John. You were a wonderful leader. And thank you, team. And thank, thank you. all of you. Uh, yes, I'd like to thank you guys for uh, making it possible for us to go down. And uh, uh, the best way for me to thank you is... Uh, John told us on our way down to look out for God's sightings. I'm going to try to share mine with you. Uh, and be patient. Use your imagination. I don't believe I'm noted for my eloquence. so <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I've got to start at the beginning. Uh, uh, just as we're getting ready to land on Haiti, you know, we're coming down, and I look down out of the window, and I see this, what you'd picture a beautiful coral island, surrounded by the sea, and I'm looking, man, that's really beautiful. And then we get closer, and we start landing. I look out the window again, and I notice the buildings. They look like they've been mashed, just a big fist, just mashed over and over. And it's not just one place. It's the whole country is mashed. And uh, I'm thinking, oh, man, you know, and you see people living in underneath little tin roofs. And so, well... We land and we're driving up the street and I'm watching people come out of their side streets and everything. There's just, they're getting busy. You know, they're doing life. They're not sitting, staring at the mud in despair. They're, they're getting on with life. I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe that's my God sighting, but nah, it's not. So, no despair. So, uh, uh, probably the second day, it was after I realized I was getting the punies. <laughs> and uh, we'd build a uh, cage in the morning to uh, hold the rubble. And late morning, we uh, go to another job site. And, uh, oh, we ends up, we push a uh, wheelbarrow with about 200 pounds of concrete, about, felt like miles, but I guess it's probably only 10, 15 blocks, down an alleyway, up a path to another work site. And we drop it off, and then we go to picking up boulders. I have a boulder pound. We have to carry them, say, 50 yards. And you carry them on your shoulder and throw them off. And about my third trip, I'm feeling pretty puny. <laughs> and uh, I get down there, I throw my boulder off, and I turn around. And behind me, coming along, with a little girl, a little Haitian girl. She's got two little rocks in her hand. Pretty little dress, two little pink pigtails, big smile on her face. She's just walking on, she's going to throw her boulders in this pile. At that point, I realized, you know, I didn't see any despair. But I looked back there and I saw her. I saw hope. And it was only hope that uh, God could have gave. Uh, 
12. We're missing number 11, so I'm number 12. And uh, Brittany's standing behind me going, do the rubble shuffle. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I also want to talk about the children. Uh, they were so amazing. They were one of our first days. Actually, I think it was our first day, the first morning we were there. There was this little boy throwing buckets. And he didn't quit. No shoes, um, no gloves, no eye protection, no face mask, throwing buckets. Um, and all through the week, we saw it again and again. No shoes, no gloves, no eye protection, no face mask. And they just, they passed buckets, they picked up rocks and shoveled, and it amazed me. Because here we all were, in our steel-toed shoes, <laughs> in our gigantic protective glasses with face masks on and really heavy duty gloves. And we're all getting, you know, crazy bruises all up and down our arms from passing the buckets and getting cut open from the shovels. And and they're all just very calmly and happily passing the buckets. Um, later in the week, there were a lot of girls at one of, at the last job site we were. Um, a lot of little girls, but a couple girls that were 11 and 12 years old, and they were passing buckets in the full bucket line. Um, and they never quit, and they were singing like the whole time. Bucket goes up, bucket goes down, and eventually we st um, on our water break, we started doing the limbo to bucket goes up, bucket goes down in Creole. Um, it was really fun. You probably saw that video. Um, and also, on our way down from Port-au-Prince to Grand Guave and from Grand Guave back to Port-au-Prince, there were, there was all this land with a bunch of tents crammed onto it. Little, seriously, not even good tents. Sticks with sheets over top of them. And maybe some tarp if they were lucky. And it... I don't know, I don't know how they live like that, but no, I didn't see anybody, I didn't see anybody uh, just sitting. Everybody had something to do, um, helping themselves, helping each other, and everybody smiled at you. If you smiled at somebody, they smiled back. They looked you right in the eye and said, bonjour, bonsoir, good morning, good afternoon, for those of you who don't speak Creole. <laughs> <laughs> and they were all so friendly it just it amazed me and touched my heart and I wanted to share it with you I just want to start by saying thank you again for supporting us we had a lot of uh, fundraisers going on um, and it definitely helped but second of all I want to thank the dear Lord for ibuprofen <laughs> um, you know, I am a little older now, and I didn't really realize it until like the third day, and I said, okay, ibuprofen, here I come. But uh, I think every one of us had our share of ibuprofen or Tylenol or something, um, and I'm so thankful for that for sure. And I can tell you, when I was raising my hands in praise this morning, I forgot my uh, ibuprofen, and I felt it. I'm still in the aftermath there, but anyhow. Um, it was a humbling experience. It's just it amazes me how people are so happy, like everybody else before me has said, in, in the desperate living conditions that they have. Um, the one thing that really I, I just couldn't understand, or and I'm not sure I need to ask questions about it, but um, they had rivers. The riverbeds were where they threw their garbage. I mean, and for miles, these riverbeds, you could see nothing but their garbage. And I think they burn them. Do they burn them in the rivers? But um, I'm thinking to myself, you know, we have garbage dumps uh, that we don't see, but they see it all the time. And um, the one job site that we were at, the, the main one, there was this gentleman, and I believe that they were carpenters. I mean, that's what they were working on the whole time. 
the one, he had built a casket, and uh, it was in behind his building, but he was standing out front, this older man, and he's using a a regular uh, saw, but he's using it up and down like this, and he was cutting a board that was about this thick, and I forget even how long it was, but he actually cut this, not even watching, and, you know, one steady, slow pace, and it was perfect. And I'm thinking to myself, I can't do that with a rip saw or with a jigsaw, but this man is doing it by hand. And uh, I was just totally amazed with how he was not even looking at it and how it came it came about. But the other thing, too, I remember Gene in the compound that we stayed or the complex that we stayed, it was beautiful in there. I mean, it was truly um, a blessing to have that area that we were in. And I remember um, Gene coming to the, the gentlemen that were using the power saws and ask them to stop using them because the electricity was going. And we had he had generators that would uh, pull the electricity back up. But I thought, wow, and how much we take for granted. We just plug something in and take off and, and um, you know, uh, curling irons for one or blow dryers. But the electricity there is very, very nil. And uh, it humbled me to see him say to the no, no more, no more uh, power saws. So the gentlemen in the crew that were using the power tools learned again how it was like not to have power and uh, I think that was humbling for them as well. But I just want to say thank you again. It, it was just a true blessing for me. I'm from uh, suburban Philadelphia, and I've been volunteering off and on with Habitat at Green County since I met John in 1990. And I get your newsletter, and when I saw about the Haiti trip, I knew that I wanted to come. Uh, several observations... Um, I had all kinds of perceptions of what it was going to be like when I went on the trip. I've seen all the stuff that's been on TV. And once I got there, what was interesting was the disconnect with all the destruction and the people. As everybody said, really, really wonderful people. It was really a disconnect with all that destruction. The place where we stayed, the compound, um, it was a walled compound with a wall outside, but inside was a courtyard with lots of green trees. So it was very restful. Um, I felt very safe there, um, very protected the whole time. Um, I can't say enough good things about our two young Haitian leaders. Tiga and uh, Ernst, who we named Tiga Jr., um, T <laughs> TJ. And uh, Tiga was very protective of us, always wanted to know where we were, what we were doing. I felt very protected by him. Um, Ernst, uh, TJ, um, he was with us all morning, a fantastic personality, would go to school in the afternoon. And I'd always ask him what, you know, what he was learning. So I felt very protected and, and, and safe the whole time I was there. Um, and that was a real blessing, you know, the whole time. And, and for you, I, I want to thank you for all the hospitality that your church has shown me. Thank you. Let me just say this. For those of you who heard me do this a year ago when I came back, uh, the progress that has been made at Haiti is enormous. I mean, it's one of the as as incredibly destitute as it remains, uh, the progress in roads, uh, the, the number of people in tents was dramatically reduced uh, from where it was uh, a year ago. Um, still, I mean, they all said it. You know, Rick said, you, you in, it looks like it's been bombed out the whole place. Uh, but the roads were dramatically improved. Housing going up everywhere, everywhere in Grand Guave. Um so that was a note of encouragement uh, to me. Um, as these guys were talking, I just I was writing down little things I want to snippet, so this is not well uh, organized. Rick told me, this is just the ingenuity of the people. Uh, Rick told me he saw a guy uh, wheeling a wheelbarrow. Uh, the wheel had 
was long gone, and they had taken three pieces, Steve Stenko, you'll be able to appreciate this, three pieces of three-quarter-inch plywood, shaped them into a wheel and nailed them together and taken an old tire and wrapped the outside of that wood. You know, and it was functioning well. You know, and I just think of us in our American society and how we would have pitched it. You know, and Carrie's story of the the jars of uh, the broken buckets, uh, um, God God reusing us uh, in the midst of the brokenness of our lives in some really neat ways. I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm one of the most driven people in the world. Uh, got to get this done, got to get this done, got to get this done. And uh, I was constantly frustrated uh, because everything, okay, the cement truck's going to, cement truck, that's, uh, okay, that was the wrong word. The uh, dump truck that's going to come and haul the rubble or haul the cages or whatever. It's going to be here at 1 o'clock. At 2.15. But, you know, here's the thing. The thing I realized, and people would preach this to us. They preached it to us last year. But I think it really comes through in the videos this year. Um, if, if you haven't checked out the Facebook or the website, uh, do that. Um, is it? And this is... Carrie and I talked uh, coming home about the struggles of our own lives and marriages, uh, and so much of it has to do with time pressure, all the things that we want to get done. Um, and in Haiti, there's just, you know, those stresses are not there. And uh, so what if we don't get done half the things that we think we've got to get done? Does it really matter all that much? Uh, God just knocking me over with that uh, all week long. Okay, so these guys endured spaghetti, spicy fish spaghetti for breakfast, oatmeal for dinner, cold showers. Uh, they slept, all of them slept in bunk bed. We all slept in bunk beds. Uh, we won't go more than that. Uh, sleep might be uh, an exaggeration for some. Uh, one fellow from Virginia just, you know, there was, I guess there was a refrigerator somewhere on the compound, just a little one. Uh, so we would get cold sodas at lunchtime. I think somebody may have mentioned that already. Cold sodas at lunchtime. And that was the only cold we experienced all day. Uh, one fellow from Virginia said he was looking forward to getting on the airplane. He was just going to ask for a cup of ice, and he was just going to put it in front of him and stare at it. <laughs> uh And it was true, the little things in life. Uh, here's another one, favorite memory. We did, we were supposed to go swimming. Uh, anyway, we went swimming Sunday afternoon in these crystal blue waters, which was some distance from the river. That once one, one person talked about the, I guess Janice, maybe the trash that uh, gets, there is no, you know, there are no trucks. I mean, there are trucks, but there are no trucks reserved for garbage hauling. So you just take your stuff down to the river and throw it in the river. Janice mentioned it gets burned. That's after the pigs and the goats and everything else have gone through it for whatever they're going to get out of it, which is after the people have gone through everybody else's garbage to get what they're going to get out of it. And that's just left to be washed down to the sea. So we moved about 10 miles down the beach from that and went swimming in these crystal blue waters. And I don't remember who it was, and I don't mean to be picking on it. This was just a humorous note. Brittany or Janice or somebody found this beautiful conch shell out in the water and <clears throat> picked it up. No, here we are. We're 17 of us or 29 of us, 29 of us at the beach right there on the ocean. Picks the conch shell up, puts it to her ear. Was it Julia? Yeah. And, and says, I can hear the ocean. <laughs> Okay, so here's the thing, just to keep the balance on this uh, business of trash, because there was trash everywhere, and we actually, I was so excited, because Jeremy Holloway, who, Holloman, who's the uh, guy who designed the rubble houses and it manages this thing, um, had talked last year about coming up with some sort of uh, trash recycling program or something. We actually sat on the plane from Port-au-Prince to New York going back with a young guy who was in front of us, seated in front of us, who was talking about the fact that he's um, with a company 
that is uh, working to get a power plant built in Haiti that would run on trash, um, uh, burning trash. So that was really exciting. But what I was going to say is, that in, you know, you, you ha there is trash everywhere. And yet, you would see people out there, day after day, sweeping their dirt floors. Uh, yeah, uh, broke my heart again and again. Okay, uh, one more uh, funny story, and then I'm almost done here. Somebody mentioned this young guy, Tiga. Tiga and Ernst were these two Haitian guys who were Christians, um, so cool. They were so, so protective of us as, uh, forget who said it, but, but here, this was one example. We went for a walk. Almost every evening we would go for a walk around Grand Guave. It's a town of 30 or 40,000 people. Uh, probably, what is that, the equivalent of Washington, maybe something like that. Um, and most times they would, one of them or both of them would go with us to kind of keep us safe, keep us on course or whatever. We went out <clears throat> and I s told Gene, who was Gene Fouché, who was the uh, guy whose compound we were staying in. I said, Gene, we're just going for a walk. N neither Tiga or Ernst is around. We're just going to go. I feel like I'm, we're fairly safe. We had with us Seth Pickens from the guy from LA who spoke Creole. He had spent two years in Haiti in the Peace Corps. So anyway, we walked down this one street, came back, and about halfway back, the power went out in the entire town, which is a common thing in Haiti. I mean, you just don't, you cannot rely on the power, but it, we all had flashlights. We're not nervous. I said, you know, you guys, we need to go up and see the, the highway where things are really hopping. So we walked up the highway, walked back, came back to the compound, found that Tiga had gotten word that we were out and about, and he was riding his motorcycle or his bike everywhere looking for us. Or Ernst was out looking for us. Okay, but here's the thing that cracked me up was the next morning I said, Teague, I'm sorry that uh, we caused you any anxiety or whatever. And he said, oh, it's okay. He said, I heard you were up by the highway. Now think about that. A town of 30 or 40,000, and this kid, I think he's 25, he had his people everywhere. I heard you up by the highway. I guess it's the fact that the Blancs, the whites, stand out, but <laughs> it blew my mind. I got the chance, uh, the group got to meet uh, a young man who I had met uh, last year. Um, he came to the work site last year, and we intentionally went back to his church, Michelle, who uh, is in a wheelchair. And... Uh, Carrie and I saw him back off uh, in his wheelchair, the front of the, their church, which was, what did it carry, a nine-inch to a foot drop or something like that? Two feet, okay. Just, and hit the ground and rolled off. I mean, it was just, I mean, he, it was amazing, the, the dude's ability to ground. This is all dirt, dirt everywhere, dirt roads, which is a, the word road is, in some places, is uh, um, too nice a word. Uh, he gets around in this wheelchair. Amazing. But the more amazing thing is, as a kid who's not allowed his disability to defeat him, he is a guitarist uh, as good, I think, as Doach. Uh, he's, he's simply an amazing, um, and sat there and led worship. Um, again, those who were on the worship team and, and any of the rest of you who ever been around I, I i am no musician at all the pastor would start singing some song and within three notes he's picked up what key it is and is playing the thing and he's got now he's got the bass guy he's got the drummer going and um it, to me it was it was a work of art <laughs>